Feeling burned out? Bounce back. Today on Oz, your days of exhaustion are over. The plan to turbo fire your energy in just 10 days. Dr. Oz breaks it down. Five simple steps to a powerful new you. Plus, GMO foods back in the headlines. What the food industry is trying to hide now. Dr. Oz reveals what you have the right to know. Coming up next on Dr. Oz. Today, a complete energy turnaround. If you're feeling burnt out, your days of exhaustion are over. Because today, I'm going to show you how to turbocharge your energy in just 10 days. Now, I've broken it down into five simple steps that will rev up your nutritional, mental, and physical energy. Every two days, you're going to add a new way to turbo fire your energy. I think you guys are be excited about this. Lola's going to start us off. She says she needs energy all the time. She's a full energy overhaul. Welcome, Lola, to the show. So I got a little exercise here. You're going to speak for everybody here. So you're so tired, you're dropping the markers. I'm, so, I'm exhausted, Dr. Oz. I, I go through things. I go through things. I'm sleep deprived. I do stuff. <laughs> right. I'm going to get to your sleep in a second as well. It's part of energy. I want you to cross out the days of the month that you're typically exhausted. You can just scrap it. Well, all of them. <laughs> all right. so I'm going to offer you a deal. A simple little deal. You give me just 10 of these days. Just give me 10 of them, right? And I will give you the energy you need for all the rest, and you'll have tons to spare for your friends. <sighs> Dr. Oz, I'm willing to give it a shot. I can't make any promises or commitments, but I can give it a shot. It's simple stuff, easy steps. Everyone can do them, but you're going to have to spread the word once you get your energy back. You're going to be like a your bunny rabbit. I could do that. I hear, by, by the way, you do some pretty awkward things when you are tired. Is <laughs> that true? Dr. Oz, I've done things. Sleep deprivation has made me do things. I have walked out of my house with mixed match sneakers. We have a pair. There, it's like, this is you, right? That's you. In my defense, they are the same type of sneaker. They're, they're the same size sneaker. The I'm not sure they're the same type sneaker. anymore. All right, come on. Yeah. So that's we've all been there. I, it's you know we kick ourselves around for walking out of the house with mismatched shoes or socks or ear earrings, but it happens a lot. So let's get revved up. We're going to start off with nutritional energy. Days one and two, everybody. Turbo fire your breakfast with something called tyrosine. Now you've never heard of tyrosine. It's an important building block for proteins in the body. Valuable for lots of reasons because it, you need it actually for your brain to work the way it works and for your body, literally for the muscles to fire the way they're going to fire, and they work together in unison. So it'll make you feel more energized at several different levels. And since you're sleep deprived in particular, you'll find this little handy. So what's a typical breakfast you have? Coffee. Coffee? Maybe a slice of toast. If I could remember to grab it after getting everybody out of the house, I might grab some toast. I don't know about the tyrosine thing stuff in there and coffee and toast, but. Forget about the tyrosine <laughs> stuff. I can tell you there's no tyrosine in coffee and there's nothing toast either, but you can use the toast here. You can use the toast. Eggs have tyrosine. In fact, pro remember I said it's a building block of proteins? All the healthy proteins have amino acids. Tyrosine is one of them. So eggs have it. You can put it on your toast with your coffee if with you want, with your mismatched sneakers. Right? <laughs> you, you, a, a serving of, of cottage cheese will get you there, low fat. A serving of salmon will get you there. You pick it as you wish it, but I want that to be part of your breakfast. You need to get that tyrosine into your life early on. Those are my first two days of your plan. Maybe you gave me 10 days back. <laughs> of the 31, 10. you're exhausted. I'm exhausted, Dr. Oz. All right. So days three and four are all about super hydrating foods. Do you drink enough water? There's 12 cups of water in my coffee pot right now. That's got to count. Yeah? Doesn't count at all. Dr. Oz. No, it doesn't. 12. <laughs> it doesn't catch me to pee that out. Most people don't really know how much water they're taking in. But even if you're drinking enough water, uh, most people think they are and they're actually not because they're losing the water from places they never would have expected it. Mm -hmm. So I want to make it easy. When you're dehydrated and you don't even sense it most of the time, automatically it slows you down. You become like sludge inside of you. So I want you to start eating foods that naturally have a lot of water in them. These are all the foods. They will turbocharge your energy if, they're, if they have more than 90% water. So cucumbers, which happen to have the most water of anything, it's basically water in a little green shell here. The celery I happen to love, the peppers, the salad, the, the uh, cauliflower celery. You pick what you want. Okay. I don't know if you have a favorite here. It doesn't frankly matter, but I want you to add one cup of these to your meals. Okay. But here's the caveat. Again, yeah, for days three and four, I don't want you cooking these too much. Because when you cook these, you actually dehydrate them. You pull the fluid out. And you lose a lot of the beneficial nutrients when you cook them too much. So raw vegetables, one cup a day. Oh, Dr. Haas, this is a lot of pressure. Here, here, start eating. <laughs> Thank you very much, Lola. All right. <laughs> now, I know my viewers love the snack. 
That's the next area we're going to attack. Days from five and six are to trade your snacks for a half a cup of coconut chips. Now, this is the latest and the greatest way to get more energizing fats to turbocharge your brain power. But I hear there's a group of women who actually need some convincing. I've been told not all of you are sold on coconut. Where are the coconut haters? Here they are. Well, the coconut haters are here. How about you guys? Hi. Describe for me succinctly why you don't like coconuts. Personally, I hate the grainy texture. It's, I've tried and tried and tried to love it, but I can't. Texture. It's oily, it has a lot of fat in it, that kind of scares me away. The coconut oil is greasy, it's messy in my kitchen, and it's just not worth the mess in the morning. All right, I'm gonna give you something, a little surprise that I brought for you guys. You can share it with the rest of the audience if you want. You don't have to, you can keep it for yourself, but I want you to taste this. These are a perfect, crunchy combination of all the things the snackers want that will also give you energy. I'll pass it around, don't be greedy. Mm. Oh, what do you guys think? I could do that. <laughs> oh, yum. Oh, Charlie, they want more. They want more. <laughs> yeah. Pass it around up there. You guys, now here's the thing. What I, what I love about these is that they have the right kinds of fats, these short little fats that your brain can actually use to give it more energy. So you stop feeling like you're mo going in slow motion. And because I think you agree they taste great, mm -hmm. this should be a hot do product this year. All these different kinds of coconut chips are coming out. Find the ones that you like the most, make them part of your snacking. And remember, those kinds of snacks are actually okay for you. As in replacement of a lot of the other bad snacks you guys are traditionally putting in your body that slow you down. All right, thank you very much. Everybody. Thank you. All right, day seven and eight are about turbo firing your afternoon slump. Bonnie says her local coffee shop knows her afternoon order by heart. Is, this, is that your extra cup? It sure is. Dreaming big, I see it says. So what's, what's the order that they recognize you ordering? It's a large caramel macchiato with skim milk, whipped cream, and an extra shot. Extra shot? Yes. Just for a little extra something to go. Yes. All right, so I put your order into my energy calculator. Are you ready? I hope so. All right, I'm gonna share with you. So not surprisingly with the extra shot, it has 200 milligrams of caffeine. I'll come back to that in a second. The problem, the bigger problem is 41 grams of sugar. Yikes. I mean, it's, a, it's really a candy bar in a shake form, mas masquerading as coffee. That's what you're ordering. Okay. So the caffeine <laughs> and the sugar both do the same thing. They backfire on you, could take you to a big high jump, and then of course, you have to come back down again. The sugar in particular will really put you in sugar coma, and then they sabotage your sleep at night. Yes. Are you a good sleeper? Sometimes. Yeah. A lot of people think they get away with coffee, especially in the afternoon. It's not as common as you think. A lot of folks actually have issues with those caffeine. So on day seven and eight, I want to turbocharge your afternoon slump with a iced pineapple tea. Now this pineapple tea is going to happen after two o'clock in the afternoon. It's very straightforward. It's basically an iced white tea, which you know, young tea is the freshest tea. It has these catechins in it that give you a lot of energy, but okay. it doesn't have as much caffeine. But you're going to add a little bit of unsweetened pineapple juice. I'll trade you your coffee. You'll taste my little tea. And it's the perfect amount of caffeine and has just the right amount of natural sweetness. Mmm, that is good. A real smile. <laughs> All right, so you can hold on to this in the meantime, but I okay. want you to make this part of your afternoon. Again, a very simple thing for days uh, seven and eight. Thank you okay. very much. Thank All right. You. Now, I'm saving something very important for the last two days. It's, it's so important that I actually got my granddaughter, Philo, who's the inspiration for this idea involved. Here she is running around my daughter's apartment. Now listen, listen carefully. Ah! Yeah. Oh no, Casey. Yeah. Ah. That, that banshee cry she just heard her do, that's what kids all do, right? Why do they do that? They're full of energy and they need to breathe. And that banshee yeah! is their breathing. They breathe more deeply for a lot of reasons. It's natural and they don't get in the way of it being natural. In fact, stress makes us take short, deep breaths. You'll notice that when someone's nervous around you, or your kids, for example, their breathing gets shallow. They exchange less oxygen and their energy, therefore, doesn't flow as readily through the body. So we're gonna do this together. We're gonna try taking a deep breathing exercise together when you're losing steam in the day. But we're gonna use one that is a little different. It's an ancient yogic tradition that helps de-stress and energizes you at the same time. We're all gonna do it. Ready to do this? Look at the diagram. You put your tongue behind the upper uh, the teeth. Like, like that. Uh -huh. And then, then you inhale through the nose. All do it together on a count of four. Inhale. Mm -hmm. Four, then hold that breath for a count of seven. And then slowly exhale. <sighs> I'm not hearing you exhale. <laughs> Fill up your lungs again one more time real quick. We're gonna all exhale together and for out your side. But I want you to keep that tongue to the back of your teeth, right at the top of your palate, and then exhale together. Are you ready? <sighs> 
I know it sounds like you're having a bowel movement, but you're not. <laughs> it actually works very effectively. You're gonna repeat that several times and you feel slumped out and you can turbocharge your energy on days nine and 10. Listen, I gave it to you in 10 days. You go to my website, DrOz.com for all my Turbo Fire energy boosters. We'll be right back. <laughs> Next, are there GMOs in your food? Do you have a right to know? A growing controversy. How the food industry is sneaking GMOs into your everyday food without labeling them. And what you can do to find out what you're buying before you buy. Next. All new Oz, her three girls, killed in a Christmas fire. Who helped you understand that there was a path to healing? (sighs) The grief cure that changed everything. That's coming up tomorrow on Dr. Oz. the audience the question you think about this at home as well should gmo foods be labeled do you the consumer have the right to know who's got thoughts about this yes. some yeses up there can, can, articulate that why do you think that is well i'm a mother i have two children I, I teach school and i know that we need to know what's in our children's food it affects them how they perform academically behaviorally socially And I think that the supermarkets must let us know. It's our right to know what we're putting into their bodies. Thank you very much. (laughs) Come up. So whenever I go to the supermarket, there hasn't been a day where I don't look at what I'm consuming. Um, I'm all about uh, full-on ingredients and knowing exactly what I'm buying. So I feel like when things are not labeled correctly, I feel like I might be cheated. So it is very important for me to have that. You all share these opinions? Uh, Have a seat. So I actually asked this question in a DrOz.com poll. 98%, almost everybody in our audience would prefer to know if the food that you're buying contains GMOs. But sometimes you're not given the choice. And here's why. It's almost impossible to avoid GMOs these days. Nearly 70% of the foods in your supermarket are made with GMOs. In fact, GMOs increase the amount of pesticides in your food, which is one of the issues that's come up. And the Environmental Protection Agency just approved a new, even more potent pesticide that works specifically with GMOs. It's called Enlist Duo. It helps kill off super weeds that have come up because of the GMOs and the pesticides for them. Now, I know most of you use food labels to help make healthy choices for you and your family. We've heard about that from the audience already. So why is the food industry fighting the labeling of GMO foods? Scott Faber's here. He's from the Environmental Working Group, and he spent 20 years, many years, Try to stop supermarkets from sneaking GMOs into your food every single day. He says there are three ways the food industry is sneaking GMOs into your food. The first has to do with preservatives. Why are there GMOs in our breads and our bagels? That's right. Many of the preservatives and additives that are added to things like bread and bagels are derived from genetically engineered corn and other GMO crops. They're used to make food last longer, taste better, look better. But many consumers would be surprised to know that there are GMOs and things we eat every day like bread. It's really a coincidence. You wouldn't have actually thought of putting them there, but since they're ubiquitous, you put them in there. You wouldn't think something like citric acid, a preservative, would be derived from corn, but ultimately many of the preservatives included in these products are are derived from GMO crops. All right. The next area that we're getting GMO stuck into our food has to do with oils. And a lot of families depend on frozen meals. I, I think, would you all be sort of shocked to know that there are GMOs in a lot of these foods? It's unbelievable. Uh, and, and many frozen foods contain both proteins and oils that are derived from GMO crops, GMO corn, GMO soy, GMO canola, things like corn chips are often fried in vegetable oil. If you see vegetable oil, that almost always mean a GMO oil like canola oil. Even things like Mayonnaise, salad dressings, tomato sauce contain uh, GMO oils, especially soybean oil. You should be really careful about the stuff you're buying and then put you know, a salad dressing on it uh, or a fredo sauce and you get, you're getting it pulled down. There are oils that don't have GMO elements to them. Olive oil, safflower oil, coconut oil. Remember those ones. Those are the ones you want to choose if you want to avoid GMOs in your oils. And then we have sweeteners. What kinds of sweeteners are, are rich in GMOs? Yeah, anything that's a sweetened soda, sweetened juice, cookies contain sweeteners. When you see a sweetener of any kind, you have to assume it's from a GMO corn or GMO sugar beet. In particular, things like corn syrup, especially high fructose corn syrup, are derived from GMO corn. So there are sweeteners that don't have GMOs in them, obviously. Honey is one because the bees make it. We don't have GMO bees yet. Agave and stevia, all right? So keep those in mind. At least that's a way of making sure your foods don't have GMOs. Now, 
It's got the food industry spent $100 million. I see these campaigns going on over and over again, fighting the labeling of GMO foods at the state level. 90% of our audience, actually just about everybody, and I, our audience is not alone. I think most people in America actually want their GMO foods labeled. Most people around the world, in the Western world, have GMO labeling. Why is the food industry fighting this? Well, one reason is they are worried that if we know what's in our food, if, if we know that there are GMO ingredients in our food, that we might choose something else. But the primary reason, the real reason, is that they want to control the real estate, the packaging. They want to decide what you can know about your food, and they don't want you to know the things that you may want to know about your food. And why is it peaking now? Why in the 21st century has it become a huge battle? Yeah, you know, this is an era where people want to know everything about their food. They want to know who made it, how it was made, where it was made, what's in it. We're in an era of food democracy, the likes of which we couldn't have even imagined 10 years ago. And for the big food companies to choose now, when people want to know so much about their food, to say, you can't know about GMOs, well, that, that just fuels even more consumer interest. So the absence of a label that says this has GMOs, what can folks do, the audience, do to know if they're getting GMO well, or the, not? The only sure way to know is to look for the USDA organic seal mm -hmm. or the non-GMO verified seal, the seal with the little butterfly. Or you can turn to a number of new food apps that allow you to look to scan the barcode and see if there are GMOs inside. Let's talk about one that I'm, I think will be very popular. The Environmental Working Group has a new food app that lets you know if the food that you're buying contains GMOs. It's called Food Score. So how does it work, Scott? It's really easy. You just take your smartphone, you scan the barcode, and up comes a screen that tells you whether or not there are any nutrition concerns whether there are any food additives concern, the extent to which the food is heavily processed, and whether or not the food contains organic or uh, ingredients or may, be, uh, may contain uh, GMO ingredients as well. So we reached out to the Grocery Manufacturers Association asking them why GMOs are in our food. Here's what they said in part. 20 years of research and roughly 2,000 studies have been done on GMOs. No respected, peer-reviewed journal has found any evidence that GMOs could be harmful. In fact, this research has yet to produce even a viable hypothesis on why GMOs would be harmful to human health. Now, I've got to say, I disagree with their conclusions, especially if you include the herbicide issue. But no matter what, it should be your choice, not theirs. We'll be right back. Tell us, how do you avoid GMOs in your diet? It's hard to avoid them, so I started my own garden. I keep it in my basement and power it with UV lights. It ensures that I know what's in my food. Share your thoughts on Facebook.com slash Dr. Oz. Coming up, we follow them daily, learning to eat better, cook better, and feel better. And now these top food bloggers tell all. From making comfort foods healthy to cutting salt out of your meals, they reveal their best kept secrets to good health. Next. Today, the top food bloggers reveal their secrets to better health. And there's tens of thousands of women who follow them daily, learning how to eat better, cook better, and ultimately, feel better. You guys ready to meet them? Yeah. First up is Sodium Girl. She calls herself Sodium Girl, and she's the web's go-to guide for salt-free dishes that still pack a flavorful punch. Jessica Goldman Fong's blog, Sodium Girl, gets over 50,000 views a month. The motivation behind it all? The health crisis its founder faced 10 years ago. In 2004, I was diagnosed with a severe case of lupus and as a result suffered kidney failure. And to stay alive and strong, I had to cut out a ton of sodium out of my diet. But as somebody who loves to eat, I was determined to find low sodium foods full of flavor and now I wanna show my readers how to do just that. Just because you have dietary limits doesn't mean you can't have limitless options. Sodium Girl, a.k.a. Jessica, is here. Now, for 10 years, you've cut sodium out of your diet. Mm-hmm, you got it. Now, you have a big secret you haven't told anybody about you're going to share with our audience today. Please share it with us. One thing that people don't realize is that a lot of foods actually taste salty naturally. So I put this to use in another reader favorite, my Can't Be Beat Bloody Marys, which I think we're making today yep. together. Come show me how to... Can't be beat Bloody Marys. Take us through it. It's, these, well, are all, these are salt free, right? No, this no is added salt. all salt free, and you probably know this, but one cup of bottled vegetable juice can equal over 600 milligrams of sodium. It's an easy solution, though. We make our own vegetable juice out of those somewhat salty tasting vegetables like beets, celery, carrots. You can juice it yourself, or even now you can find bottled vegetable juice with no additives. So you juice it, we're gonna add it to um, no salt added, 
tomato puree to get that velvety tomato taste of our Bloody Marys. And if you Th want that, that was also bottle bought, right? You can be bottle tomato. bought, but no salt added. So okay. you're starting from zero, and then we add in all of those Bloody Mary favorite flavors like horseradish. We've got cayenne pepper. You can feel free to sprinkle some in with me. What's this? That is um, some smoked paprika to oh. give it that smoky <laughs> taste. <laughs> That so cool I got a nice there. whiff of that. How much you put in there? Just a, a little pinch. bit, and you can adjust black pepper. A little pepper in there. You are excellent sprinkler. Yes, but better and better. And then we mix it all up, vinegar for tang. Vinegar for tang. And this is all the flavors you want. Lemon juice without the salt. Mix it up, and then for presentation, the fun part is, usually we have a salty rim, right? Yes. Instead, we're gonna rim it with smoked paprika, black pepper, and some zested lemon. You've thought of all the subtleties. You've got it. You have to have color and flavor and fun. And there you go. You know, I could just enjoy this myself, but I really think we should share with the audience. I would love to. All right, so I brought a couple shot glasses. Let's go over <laughs> here. Now, I want some honest, I want mine too. You just didn't bring mine. All right. Here, I'll hold yours. Yes, you hold mine. I want some honest opinions here. Please, take a sip. It won't take one sip and pass the glass down. No, <laughs> kidding, kidding, <laughs> kidding. People would hate mail to me if I did that. Here we are. What do, what do you guys think? I gotta taste it too. Come over here. Cheers. Cheers. Well, you, well I forgot yours, but you had it. You guys like it? Yeah. I love it. I'll tell you, this little rim, it's a very clever idea. You Thank can do you. other drinks as well. Yeah, margaritas, you could do the same. Again, get rid of the salt, replace it with something not salty, but equally full of flavor. I really wanted to have you on because I'm very proud that you were able to take control of a bad problem, a kidney disease caused by lupus, and get ahead of it. So bless you and good luck to you. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure to be here. All right. Next, I want you to meet the blogger who is making comfort food healthy. Comfort food is her calling, and she's a self-proclaimed flavor junkie. Risha Purvis's Carnal Dish Blog gets 50,000 viewers per month. The secret sauce? Risha's dishes are both decadently delicious and healthy. I have always been about decadent and delicious foods, and I still am today, but it was taking a toll on my health. So I had to step back. I lost 40 pounds, and now I've come up with ways to make my comfort food recipes healthy for everyone. I don't just want to teach people how to cook. I want to teach people how to cook from the heart, because that's the most important ingredient. Risha is here. Her blog is called Carnal Dish. Mm -hmm. Carnal Dish. How'd you come up with that name? Well, I came up with the name because I started passing out my recipes to a few friends and they were telling me that it got them lucky. It got them pregnant, married, engaged, all that stuff. All so, those carnal cravings. Yes, it appeals to the senses. <laughs> all right. So what's the biggest health secret you've been keeping from your followers? The biggest health secret is that, you know, I've learned how to make all of my decadent recipes healthy, but the biggest secret is the sticky wings that I've been keeping to myself. Show me how to do it. I'm getting hungry talking about it. Okay. All right, so you get the wings like this. Yes. Oh. These, are, these are the wings. You prep them, you brush them with a little bit of olive oil, salt and pepper, and then you bake them for about 20 minutes until they get nice and crisp. Then you just want to slather it, like just. What, what is this? This is the this is the sticky wing sauce. It is the oh. maple syrup, honey. There's a chipotle, which makes it spicy. Brown sugar, cumin, smoked paprika, cayenne pepper, lime zest, and um, these are the scallions. And you just bring that to a here. Let me do it. Just do it. Show yeah, me. I'll Pretend show I don't you. know what I'm doing because I don't. I'll show you. Yeah. You want to uh, pour all this stuff in here. Now, by the way, while this is all in here, that's cooking separately? Just like just Yes, to that's cooking crisp separately. It? You want to put that in the oven by itself for about 20 minutes. Is that too much chipotle? I put the whole thing in No, there. that's fine. That's perfect. Right. Add multi babies in there. What yes. are these again? These are. This is the lime zest, scallions. Put all the, all the stuff goes in the pot. Let's just oh. dump it all in there. The, is that okay. how you do all your carnal things? You're all in like this? Everything goes in? Everything goes in. I'm very simple, but very, I'm big on flavor. If, you, right. if it doesn't taste good, you're not going to eat it. All right, so it's all boiling up there. How long do you cook it for to make the sauce? About 10 minutes. You just want to get it nice and reduced and it gets sticky. And this is what we have right here. So you bring them out the oven and you just slather it. Like, you got to really go in with this. <laughs> do not be shy. Paint I it. I have a feeling you're not very shy. I am not shy. <laughs> Paint the wings, and then you want to just put them back in the oven for about maybe five to ten minutes. And what happens is they get caramelized and sticky. Okay. And you just eat them with someone that you love and let them lick your fingers, and it's perfect. Is this site legal on television? I don't know. <laughs> oh, see, look at that. Look at this. You I mean, see they, how they, sticky they, it is? They do look pretty good, guys. 
Mm -hmm. you know, we're gonna share this with the audience when we go to break. What do you think? Mm -hmm. Can I taste it first? Mm -hmm. Tell me that's not great. It deserves on the carnal site. Yes. It's a, it's a carnal flavor. Mm, share that with your wife. <laughs> well, to get more recipes from, from these food bloggers, you go to DrOz.com. I'll be right back. Next, get ready to look and feel more fresh-faced than you have in years. Whether you suffer from wrinkles, dry skin, or discoloration, anti-aging acids may be your solution to look younger, fast. Learn how they can work to rejuvenate your skin. Next. All new Oz, her three girls, killed in a Christmas fire. Who helped you understand mm. that there was a path to healing? <sighs> the grief cure that changed everything. That's coming up tomorrow on Dr. Oz. If wrinkles, skin discoloration, and dry skin are transforming you into someone you don't recognize, this secret will help you. It's gonna rejuvenate your skin and it could fix your biggest problems and help you look younger fast. Today, I've got the anti-aging acids to rejuvenate your skin. A dermatologist, Dr. Ellen Marmer is here. Dr. Marmer, why are acids such a great idea to rejuvenate your skin? Acids exfoliate, so they shed the skin, they kind of break apart the superficial dead skin and get rid of what you want to get rid of. Do you use acids yourself? I've done five chemical peels on my face for brown spots, yeah. Oh my goodness, that's pretty good. Yeah. No wonder you look so good. Thank but you. Let me show you how anti-aging acids actually work to rejuvenate Thanks. your skin. This is something I think you'll appreciate this. You'll, you'll understand why this is such an important topic. Here's what your skin looks like before you run the animation. Notice that we have all kinds of little things in here. You know, they, some put fat in there, some put a, little, put a little bit of oil in your skin, but the action is all up here. You've got these little rubber bands in there. And when you age, those rubber bands begin to thin out. You get these deep crevices. They're known as wrinkles. You get discoloration, other problems. And the old skin covers on top. Now you put a nice exfoliant acid there, and look what happens at the skin. You slough off the top levels. You also injure the area down below a little bit. So it begins to create new collagen, new rubber bands that pushes up that skin. It also plumps up the skin for an overall smoother and younger appearance. So Dr. Murmur, all the women in the audience are probably thinking to themselves, I need to start putting acid on my face. But there are probably some, right? <laughs> but there are probably some women who shouldn't, who wouldn't benefit as much. Absolutely. If you have very sensitive skin, if you flush a lot, you blush a lot, you really need to test that acid first. So with that product that you pick out, try it on the inner, inner part of your arm for a few days before you put it on your face. Make sure you don't get a red rash from that product. Dr. Mummer says there are at least three types of anti-aging acids that you can use depending upon your skin dilemma. Glycolic acid, kojic acid, and lactic acid. I'm gonna teach you all about them, so don't panic. Maggie's here, she's gonna start us off. Maggie, which is the skin complaint that worries you the most? What's changing as you get older? The wrinkles, wrinkles around the eyes um, are my primary concern. And I also have a lot of wrinkles on my forehead and I wear bangs to cover them up, so it would be great to have something very, to take care Very, very artfully done, I like that. <laughs> <laughs> so the anti-aging acid is glycolic acid for wrinkles. Dr. Marmor, if you could explain what this is. Glycolic acid is actually a natural ingredient found in sugar cane, but now it's made synthetically, and you can find it in medicated pads, you can find it in lotions and serums and gels. Um, so when it's at the right concentration, it can help smooth out your wrinkles. Could you show us, explain to people how they should actually apply it? Yeah, so for you, um, if we could find that forehead, um, <laughs> oh. these are these lovely medicated pads, and you might even feel it like tingling a little bit. Yep. See? Um, yep. So just a little bit. You don't want anything to really, really burn your face, because then you won't really like it. But these have a 2 to 5% concentration, so you can use this up to twice a day. Um, and then if it's a higher concentration, is it stinging? It does. You feel a little tingling. Yeah. It feels really nice. Yeah. I mean, it doesn't feel bad. It's, it's nice. It's so, gentle. It feels like it's working. That's me tickling you. Okay. <laughs> Actually, so I you was, have to come back every day to get your <laughs> to get right. the tickler there. Exactly. I've been told to use these as well, but I was told to use it once a week. If, if that's, so if that's it's a higher 10 percent, yeah. you can use it once a week. Otherwise, you're going to be sloughing off too much and causing too much of that burning injury that you mentioned. So really, if you're going to go for a nice pad like this, two to five percent, once or twice a day, and you'll know if it hurts, don't use right. it. Okay. Thanks for Great. being here. Thank All you. Right. Julie's here. So, what skin issues are occurring to you as as you age? Um, as I've gotten older, I have brown spots. I have discoloration in my skin. Um, I've considered actually a couple of these spots having a laser. Uh -huh. So the anti-aging acid here is called kojic acid. 
Yeah, this is something that most people have not heard of. Um, so kojic acid um, actually works by preventing the production of melanin. So it can come in soaps, that's kind of a new thing out now, so kojic acid in soaps, and also it can come in creams and other, and other lotions. Oh, yeah. Okay. We made a little demonstration for you and everybody to understand how this works. So melanin is created, as that like moment we were saying, if you're exposed to the sun. So you could put a little here. Go ahead, expose yourself to some melanin, because you've been doing it anyway. <laughs> oh, yes, right? I have, okay. out on the tennis courts daily. And then put you in one more spot. So what ends up happening is these pigmented areas are there trying to protect you. Mm -hmm. So what you want to try to do is apply an acid, kojic acid would do this. Here, you apply a little bit, and I'll apply a little bit. And when you apply it the right way, it'll actually reduce the production of, of a melanin that's being created. And by reducing it, you won't obviously get darker, but maybe even soak up. I'll put it right here. Go on, soak it in there. And I'll put it on mine, same kind oh. of thing. And you see how it quickly blushes them out? Uh-huh. That's the concept. Now, it's not that fast, obviously. Right. <laughs> but the hope would be that over time, this is exactly kind of the result that you're getting. So, Dr. Marmer, how long until you really would see a result like this? So, pigment comes in different layers of the skin. The superficial pigment will go away fastest. So, you might even see improvement after one week. What do you look for when you're buying the kojic acid? What's the right concentration? Kojic acid is different from other acids. You want to have just a little amount, less than 4%. All right. Yeah. Thank, you. Thank you. Benita is here. She argues she's actually getting dry skin as yes. she ages. So Dr. Marmer, why is it specifically a lactic acid you recommend for dry skin? So you know lactic acid, it sounds like it comes from milk, right? It doesn't. It comes from fermenting fruits um, and also bacteria. Lactic acid does that sloughing off exfoliation that Dr. Oz mentioned, but it also calms the skin. Um, so this you want to do, especially around the eyes, any acid around the eye, you want to be very careful that you don't get it in the eye. So one good trick is to put a little petroleum jelly right on the crease so none of the acid will pull there. And then you use a little sponge so that it doesn't kind of get all over the place. And do you mind if I put a little mm -hmm. on? Mm -hmm. Okay, so you're gonna just start gently, and then just a little bit goes a really long way, and then you're just gonna come down and around the eyes just a little bit here. And what do you look for when you're buying it? So the lactic acid does come in different strengths as well. You really wanna look for the vehicle. You want it to be in a cream and a lotion. I wouldn't go for a gel, because that can be alcohol-based and drying. So really, you're thinking about the lotion or cream, and you want it to be less than 10%, maybe maybe 12% max. This is over the counter? It's over the counter in generics, very, very easy to do. All these are over the counter. We want yeah. you to know about these because they're inexpensive. And if a board de certified dermatologist thinks they're great for you and would prescribe them to her own patients and herself right. and to me, right. you guys should know about them. Thank okay. you very Thank much. Thank you. For more information on anti aging yeah. acids yeah. through yeah. Juvenature yeah. Skin, you go to OxfordOz.com. Be right back. Tell us, what's your favorite natural anti aging remedy? absolutely obsessed with olive oil. I put a little bit on my face each evening in an effort to fight wrinkles. I really think that it works. Share your remedy on Facebook.com slash Dr. Oz. Next, ever wonder if your daily habits are healthy? Do you sleep with your makeup on? Do you salvage moldy food? Find out which routines are helpful and which are harmful. Simple ways to replace a bad habit with a healthy one. Coming up next. We are bringing healthy back this season and want you to bring it too. Grab your prescription pad for fun and sign up for free tickets today. You can go to DrOz.com slash tickets and sign up. <laughs> My email box is full of questions from people wondering if their habits are healthy. That's why I started a recurring column in my magazine answering the question, what happens when you fill in the blank? Today I've collected the best questions I've received. Take a look at your first habit. What happens when you cut off the moldy part of the bread and you eat the rest? It's okay, right? Ruth, I am not eating this. Dr. Oz, what do you think? Ruth and her best friend Latoya are here to settle their debate about moldy foods once and for all. So, Ruth, is it all the foods that you start to eat when they have mold on them? How do you tell which ones you can tolerate? Uh, I can pretty much tolerate just about anything because I'm paying my money. <laughs> so oh. <laughs> I figure if I'm buying it with my money, I'm just going to cut around the mold and eat what to me looks good. Well, saving money is admirable, but I don't want to sacrifice your health for that. So come on over here. Let's do a little <laughs> demonstration. Let me show you when, you when you take some foods and cut the mold. I'll take bread as an example. All right? Take a knife. Go ahead. Take that knife there. And show your friend Ruth. Go ahead, Latoya. Cut it through there. You cut through there, and you cut off the, the moldy part of the bread, and look what you got. You know why mold burrows deep roots into the foods? And therefore, when you cut off the surface, you really don't get all the mold out. But this is the tip of the iceberg. You'll see this. You actually won't see that quite so visibly, so you won't really know for sure. So, let's hand Ruth the, the knife if you don't mind. Let's do a little experiment over here. Come on over here. 
These are typical moldy foods that you would have spent your hard earned money getting. So obviously, you're probably not gonna eat that food, I hope, right? Would you eat that too? Well, if nobody was looking, I would probably cut the back of it off. All right, I'll give you a hint. Uh, all soft veggies and fruits, you get rid of those things, all right? Bread, we just, I just showed you. How about soft cheeses? What do you think? Well, um, soft cheese, what is that like, brie? Brie. It looks like, well, cheese to me is mold. It's got some mold on it. Yeah, some like, like blue cheese? Yep, some blue cheese has got mold you on it. You eat it, right? I, well, I, you, eat, you want the cheese to have the mold, that's why you're eating it, but then sometimes it gets extra mold, like fur on it, you don't okay, want Okay, the fur right? part I'll take off. <laughs> and how about if your yogurt looks like this? Yeah, like, I won't do that, I won't, won't even touch this. it, no. Okay. Whoa, that smells. You don't, you, you don't want to even smell this stuff because you'll get it in your lungs. So don't even go, that's nah, not good. You want, now, take the knife though and cut this hard cheese for me. If that's the mold there, right? I understand you'd probably save that, right? So go yeah, ahead. Yeah, so I would just cut that Just the part. end of it off. Yeah. Good job, all right. But look what happens. You see, you, you still have two little oh, deeper veins yeah. in there. Then I take my fingernail probably and take Yeah, you just sort of core those little babies out like that? Exactly. Yeah, all right, that's, stop that, come over here. <laughs> From now on, what we're gonna do, if it's, if it's hard cheese, because you mentioned hard cheese has mold in it naturally, exactly. you can save it, but you need to cut enough off, and the rule of thumb basically is an inch from the top to be safe. You cut an inch off, go ahead and whack that through there. And if you do that, there. Now you get a nice clean cut that's fresh, and therefore you don't have to throw away your exactly. hard-earned money. I know you guys are gonna do this stuff right, thank you. All right, folks are very guilty of this next habit. Take a look. Hey, Dr. Oz. I never take off my makeup before I go to bed. What will happen if I don't remove my makeup before I go to bed? So Jennifer is here, was honorable enough to ask that question. And you know who else cops to sleeping with her makeup on? No. Lady Gaga. Oh, Imagine how much boy. makeup that is. There she is there. Wow. That's before she went to bed, I gather. <laughs> but you see how much makeup you can put on and still sleep with it. So the real question is what happens when you don't take the makeup off? Right. So let's go over the anatomy of the skin. You hit the skin, which is this dough here, has little pores in it, right? Yeah. And you put the makeup on top of the pores to cover them up because you don't want it to look unsightly. Right. right. And then, over the day, your skin will sort of absorb that makeup. And let's say this is the dirt of the day. Okay. Yeah, and you'll get a little dirt here and here. It starts to build up. And you go ahead and put some on yours as well, oh. all right, on your skin. And the pores will begin to absorb some of the dirt. Nicely done. So, what ends up happening at the end of the day, if you wash your makeup off, is you literally take all this stuff lift it out of the pores, and toss it to allow your skin to go back to its baseline right. every single day. That's right. your goal. Unfortunately, what you're doing is you're sleeping. Right. Which is like taking a pie roller to your skin when there's makeup on there. So go ahead and roll that in now. And as you roll that makeup more deeply into your skin, oh. you'll notice what's happening. You're actually stretching the pores out and you're pushing the dirt deeply into the pores. Yeah. So now, instead of the nice little dainty pores I had here, you've got dirt stuck in them, you get blackheads, more problems with acne over time. Yeah. That happens? All the time. God, All I knew time. that was true. As it always happens on my nose, I always have blackheads on my nose, and I just thought that's my skin. Yeah. And now I get why. You know, I never had makeup on my life, in my life, until I started the show, and then I started having a blackhead problem. See? And my pores got really big. So do what <laughs> I do, happens, as yeah. soon as I don't have to have makeup on, which is literally as soon as the show's over, yeah. I quickly get it off my face. Yeah. I get myself back to this baseline, yeah. so I don't have the problems that so many of us are facing here. Right. All right. Great. Thanks for coming. Thank you. All right, the next habit is all about sleep. Dr. Oz, it's one o'clock in the morning. I can't sleep. I was thinking about taking some antihistamines. I have a big day ahead of me. What happens if I take antihistamines to fall asleep? Bonnie came in person. So what happens when you take these allergy pills to get to sleep? How does so, it make you feel? Dr. Roz, some mornings I'll wake up and I'll have lots of energy and I'm ready to run. And then others I'm kind of groggy and I'm kind of not, maybe I shouldn't have taken it. Maybe I just wasn't well, I don't know. Out of it, sort of. Yeah. Let me explain to you the truth to what's going on. Here's what happens when you take an allergy pill for sleep. Obviously you want to sleep. The pill goes into your body and it gives you those Z's initially, but it's not deep quality sleep. It's not the full panoply of Z's. You get only a couple of Z's. And then even worse, you get resistance. You build up tolerance. So you need more of those antihistamine sleep type pills in order to get it to work for you. Otherwise, you don't get any benefit whatsoever. You just get the side effects of the pills. So I don't think it's a good technique, long term especially. Right. I know people do it because it's inexpensive. We have access to them. But instead, I'm gonna give you something that you also have access to that's even cheaper. Okay. Right? It's a spoonful of honey and chamomile tea. Mm. Age old, used for a lot of reasons. The chamomile tea is a mild tranquilizer anyway. Anyone who's tried it at night knows it. 
you know, sort of takes yeah. you down a little level. The honey is actually interesting because it gives your brain a little bit of sweet and it will stimulate it as well, so it will relax throughout the evening. Oh, great, thank so you. Simple stuff that and works well. And one cup? One cup of can meal, yeah, and only a little, you know, a little half a teaspoon full of honey. Don't put the, it's not oh, half honey, honey and half chamomile syrup. Okay. All right, thank right. you. Listen, check out my new magazine, That Good Life is on newsstands now, for answers to other what happens when you questions. Be right back. Thanks, All new Oz, her three precious daughters killed in a Christmas fire. How do you cope? The grief cure that changed everything. Who helped you understand mm. that there was a path to healing? Her journey from unthinkable pain. I'm angry that I couldn't save them. To learning to live again. I'm grateful that I had my children, that I knew them. It's an all new Dr. Oz. That's coming up tomorrow. It's that time of year. You made a New Year's resolution, and now you're thinking of throwing that bad boy out the window. Take a look at your top three New Year's resolutions. Find yourself in these guys. The third most common resolution, any guesses? Lose weight. A lot of you are saying one that's not third, but first. It's actually, it's about money. It's to spend less, to save more. I'm surprised, actually, because that's usually one that sort of is out there percolating, but most people think uh, that it's out, you know, it's someone else's problem. It's actually all of our problems. Second most common New Year's resolution is to get organized. Oh, that surprised me. And drum roll, please. The number one most common resolution, some of you said it, was to lose weight. 45% of you usually make New Year's resolutions, but only 8% of you are successful in keeping them. So I want to see everyone out there be successful. So here's what I want you to do. I know I'm right, because we've done research on this stuff, and you guys are echoing it. I want you to take a picture of yourself keeping your New Year's resolutions, whether it's exercising, trying something new, spending time with your family, whatever it is, it doesn't matter to me. Take this New Year's resolution idea, take a picture of it, post it to Twitter using hashtag Oz2015, and we'll feature some of our favorites on the show. Now, it's the time for in case you missed it. First, I give you my plan to turbocharge your energy so you can have more of the energy you desire if you can be focused about it and have less stress. For those of you who turn to your afternoon coffee for energy, I want you to switch to a cleaner fuel. The amount of caffeine in coffee can backfire and disrupt your sleep, so instead, Turbo Fire Iced Pineapple Tea. After 2 p.m., very straightforward, it's an iced white tea. Then you take a shot of unsweetened pineapple juice, has just the perfect amount of caffeine, and pineapple juice will spike up your energy a little bit because it doesn't have too much sugar. Next, I look at how supermarkets are sneaking GMOs into your everyday foods. And there's one item I want you to be aware of, oils. There's a laundry list of oils out there that likely contain GMOs, things like vegetable and corn, canola, soybean, and other types of oils. But here's some oils that are not made with GMOs that I want you to know about. Olive oil, safflower oil, and coconut oil. Those are the ones you can opt for if you're worried about GMOs. Finally, please be careful about dubious people online that make it seem like I'm endorsing their products. I don't. To see a full list of our trusted sponsorship partners, you go to DrOz.com, and I'll see you next time. <laughs>